to Naomi Andre. Thank you for joining us. She's a professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, Women's and Gender Studies, and the Residential College at the University of Michigan. So thank you for joining us. On our panel, uh, we have Kristen Yancey, a dancer, actor, singer, and creator whose Broadway credits include The Share Show and Summer, the Donner, Donna Summer Musical. Delisa Andrews, known for her appearances in the West End and The Life and Nativity, the musical. And Dominic Sibanda, who was part of the West End cast of Disney's Aladdin, Hairspray with Royal Caribbean, and most recently, play Prince Charming in the Theater Royal Windsor's Cinderella. Uh, we. Our other panelist, Ephraim Sykes, has not been able to join us yet. If uh, he is able to, uh, we will bring him on and make a quick introduction. But uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it over to you, Naomi, and thank you, panel, for joining us. Thank you so much. It is really a pleasure and an honor to be here. And um, I'm a late addition to this panel as the original moderator, unfortunately, became unavailable. But I also wanna say I'm new to this conference and conferences that focus on musical theater. I'm just gonna get that out in the open. And to say I'm a big fan um, and have seen many musicals, but my own academic work has been um, in the related, I'd like to think of as sister genre of opera and particularly around gender um, representation of women's voices. There was that fun moment in the late 18th, early 19th century where um, women would perform as male characters, en travesti, trouser rolls, pant rolls. I wrote a book about that. Um, and then more, most recently, my work has focused around racial constructions and particularly blackness and opera. So when I saw this conference online, I eagerly registered for it um, when I got the email announcement and I am loving it. And really, as I'm getting to learn the rhythms and textures of this field, learning repertoire, and really trying to follow the conversations, um, because there's still a lot I'm learning. I just am going to say a couple of sentences now to set up this panel, and then we're just going to focus on the incredible experiences and voices of this panel who um, are joining us. And um, Yes, Chris. I want to right welcome here. Ephraim. Yes, Ephraim, just uh, join us. Hey, Ephraim, how are you? If Ephraim Sykes, uh, we get, given everyone else's bio, Ephraim, let me give you a proper introduction. Uh, oh, he'll okay. be star starring in the upcoming MJ the Musical after receiving a Tony nomination for his role in Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations, and previously appearing in the original cast of Hamilton, Memphis, Newsies, and Motown the Musical. So welcome, Ephraim and Kristen. Glad you got your camera on. <laughs> and yeah, now I'm going to turn works. mine off. So thank you, Naomi. Oh, a pleasure. And thank you so much for doing those bios. It's so hard to condense such, you know, incredible folks. Also, I want to remind you that the bios are in the program book so you can get even more about this. But I'm going to say just a couple of words before we move on to um, the conversation and hearing from our incredible panelists. I want to say just from my vantage point as an opera scholar, I look to musical theater as being much more evolved regarding how race is presented on stage. In opera, we are just having the conversations about why it might be a little difficult for the audience today in 2021 to see a non-Black person put on dark makeup and sing the title characters in Verdi's Aida or Otello. Puccini's Japanese fantasy of Madama Butterfly and made-up Chinese fairy tale of Turandot even up through the pandemic, we're still regularly seen in yellow face performance. My understanding is that black face and yellow face or brown face for Latinx characters is not part of the musical theater tradition. Though there are not enough people of color around who um, have made it on the stage in opera, so we don't have a large number of folks um, of people of color in opera. Well, we kind of do, but they're not, that, that's another conversation. Um, and due to a leaky pipeline for getting people through enough representing the people of color who could be performing on opera stages, as well as, you know, I'll admit it, I think there's some real strong biases in casting in opera. There's an interesting practice that allows people of color to sing roles that are traditionally thought of as white. 
Hence, multiracial casting really does happen in Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro, Rossini's Barber of Seville, Verdi's Rigoletto, and many other canonic operas in the repertory. To me, it seems that musical theater has a different relationship, and I'm going to put this word in quotation marks, with realism and how they cast different visible racial and ethnic performers. But I might be incorrect, and I wanted to throw that out as I'm coming at this from an opera vantage point. I think there's so many things to be gleaned around representation and how that's done, because even though I think musical theater, as I said, and I'm still learning, seems to be ahead of the opera world in terms of thinking about these things. The opera world does have this idea of, and I'm nervous to use the term colorblind casting, but sort of an openness in casting. So I throw that out there as something to think about. I want to very heartily thank all of you um, for your generosity and being here and sharing some of your experiences and vantage points, because I know that this is um, not always an easy um, thing and it can be draining. And I really appreciate us spending this time to be able to talk together. I was thinking we would have an order of panelists taking advantage of the gender and geographic um, uh, multiplicities that we have in here um, with women and men and however else you want to um, identify that um, we'll have Jalisa Andrews, um, Ephraim Sykes, Dominique Sibanda, and Christian Yancey as we move between men and women, the people whose careers are primarily based in the U.S., people whose careers are in um, the West End. So with that, let's start with Jalisa and thank you all again. Hi everyone, I'm Jalisa. I'm originally from Wales, which is a very small little country in um, the UK. Um, yeah, so I've done quite a bit of work with Fringe Theatre, West End Theatre, and um, in the UK as well, we do quite a lot of touring work as well, so I've done that. And also um, I've done a bit of TV work as well, which is really fun. Um, but yeah, that's me. Sure, and we can actually just move on if you want to say a little bit. There has been an introduction that talks a little bit about you, but starting off with just um, an introduction of who you are, if you want to jump into any of these issues about experiences you've had that are particularly strong and good with how sort of your casting in different roles, feel free to do that now. We can go around several times. I don't know, Jalisa, if you wanted to jump back in or if um, we could go to Ephraim. Oh, your mic is still open, Jalisa. Oh. Okay, so <laughs> no problem. You know, it's always hard to figure out what are the signals? How do we do it? Um, Ephraim, please jump in. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Ephraim Sykes, uh, originally from St. Petersburg, Florida. I've uh, been living in New York for about almost 18 years now. Um, my, actually, I came here for college, Fordham University and Alvin Ailey uh, have a conjoint uh, BFA program that I graduated from and toured with the Ailey 2 company for two years. So my background actually, uh, especially in terms of actual, you know, collegiate studies is in dance. That was my primary focus, dance and uh, instrumental music since I was a young child. The singing and acting has developed uh, more so later, especially when, it, when we get to my Broadway credits. Uh, but honestly, the performing and the singing especially started off for me in the, the Black Gospel Church down in Florida. My father being a pastor, and a musician, my mother being a gospel singer and a musician. So that's kind of where I got my foundation for now this musical theater world that I've kind of been thrust into uh, because of my dance experience, which, you know, you guys heard all the credits from, you know, Motown to Memphis to Newsies to Hamilton and Ain't Too Proud. And now, you know, this next uh, MJ musical. Um, so yeah, I kind of was able to find my way through it uh, and learn as I, as I went along. And I've had the very, uh, the fortune of working from, um, being able to have the perspective from being a, the sole black member of a company surrounded completely by uh, not only white people on stage, but of course on the other side of the table and the directing and the writing and the music and everything else. I've done that to some of the biggest black shows you've ever heard of, like Motown and Memphis, uh, Ain't Too Proud, which are uh, completely black on stage, but still that lack of diversity behind the table. Um, and just, you know, so I, I, and then something like Hamilton, which is always very diverse, but still has a, a number of issues. So I've had very much the fortune of being able to work in this business for a long time and see a lot of sides of it. Um, 
uh, the problematic things, the great things. Uh, so yeah, I'm honored to be on this call. Oh, thank you so much. And again, I really appreciate the sort of your openness to share these things. I probably should have mentioned more of each of your incredible um, accomplishments. We've got Hairspray is in here. And I was just thinking of um, both men have played um, in, in that uh, show. We've got the Lane, because I actually did write out stuff. The Lane Theater Arts in Surrey, England has been important for both Jalisa and um, Dominique. So we've got a lot of nice little connections here, um, as well as just an incredible range of um, backgrounds. But to keep moving on and sort of as you feel comfortable talking about different experiences you might have had, sort of what it's been like in all Black shows such as Michael Jackson, the show that um, Ephraim is going to be um, in or as soon as, yeah, as things become, it, who's in, but it'll continue a little bit more. <laughs> oh my goodness. Dominic, let's move to you. Hello everyone, lovely to meet you all. Great to see Jaleesa again, it's been a while. <laughs> um, a little bit about myself. I um, was born and raised in Cambridgeshire in England, um, in a small town called Huntingdon. Uh, I'd say Cambridgeshire majority sort of white sort of very much a white sort of area uh i grew up as a, a dancer uh being sort of like the, one of the only boys and one of the only mixed race boys um i was very much sort of always pushed to to um to do things like which as to anyone who maybe seems who knows me to do things like uh hip-hop dance like dance like that is it's just so not me but for any teacher who sees me walk in the room and track these they're like oh I bet you're a great street dancer. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, that's been very much a big part of uh, my training. Um, whereas I've always sort of enjoyed more sort of the classical sides of like more like your ballet, if I'm, if I'm honest with you. Um, I then went to, to train at Lane Theatre Arts in Epsom, which again is a, it's a very wide majority sort of area, um, both geographically and in terms of the college, um, which will go into sort of accessibility and all that sort of stuff later on. Um, and in terms of the shows that I performed in, the main thing I wanted to talk about today was actually roles I never thought I would play. And um, I know um, in, in the UK, uh, pantomime is a huge thing. It's, it's everywhere every year and everyone absolutely loves it. Um, whereas it's not so much a thing in the US, is it? Pantomimes, to, to my knowledge. No, <laughs> no. Um, <Not> too much. <laughs> It, it does. They're fantastic. I absolutely love it. So could um, you explain that a little more for the US based folks who might not know so much about pantomime? So pantomimes are sort of hosted at many, many theatres in the UK, sort of from around November to the latest sort of February sort of time of absolute sort of latest. Um, they're sort of traditionally Christmas shows, but amazingly, not really with any mention of Christmas in it. Um, they're just sort of uh, fairy tale sort of things like your, your snow white cinderella jack and the beanstalk mm -hmm. um and they are then taken from from these uh stories and put on stage with like amazing dance numbers with amazing choreographers uh huge songs like you have people do, like for example when i was doing cinderella at the theater Royal windsor which was an amazing experience um cinderella's sort of main song was the wizard and i which became Dandini and I, <laughs> and they use all these sort of amazing big musical theatre songs um, in all these pantomimes. It's it's a great experience, oh, wow. and so I really recommend to anyone in the US if you come to the UK, make sure you see a pantomime because you will not be disappointed. Um, the <laughs> honestly, they're fantastic. <laughs> um, there's a lot of British humour in there, which may go. Be, <laughs> it's very sort of like uh, a very cultural sort of towny thing. It'd be like local boy from down the road plays this part. Um, but yeah, there were some sort of parts I'd always watch as a kid going to pantomimes. I'd always see like uh, your sort of your Prince Charming sort of roles. And it was something I was, I'd never crossed my mind I'd ever be able to play. Um, yeah, it was just something I just thought, I don't know. I don't know why I never um, related with that. I never associated myself with that part. I was like, oh, because it's always the standard six foot three uh, white male lead. Um, that you see in many Disney films. Um, that's who. That's you... why we never think of these things. You're absolutely exactly, right. Exactly. What do we see out there? And then for you guys to do these roles, and it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely, and it's incredible. I've worked with some really amazing directors, and I've been lucky enough to play a prince in, in two pantomimes, um, which has, has been such such fun experience. Um, 
and just something I never really thought like when my my agent who would send me for um, these auditions I'd be like me <laughs> all right <laughs> I'll give it a go um and yeah I just have so much fun with it and I think why didn't I see myself as that like why why did I decide to not see myself as that and it's because I I don't I've not seen others in these roles and I've, there's never been someone to be like oh I want to be like him it's always which is again something we'll go into later the the clown part the funny part the the jester in the show um yeah it's it's maybe the so many of us are just, yeah the comic relief we're always the comic relief mm. and you don't even realize it whether you even told it from a young age oh yeah you're gonna make a great like this person in this like the, the funny character, the jester, the clown, it's always that same part. You're never like, oh, when you're, when you're older, you're going to be, a, you're going to be Prince Charming. You're going to be a princess. You're going to be this. It's, it's always, you can be funny. Yeah. Um, and that's again, something we'll get into much later on. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just a bit about me and my experience, a small bit of my experiences on stage. Oh, I so appreciate your sharing this. It's so interesting to hear. I mean, we look at you and think, oh, you guys are so famous and it's amazing. <laughs> internalized stories that the rest of the world have and then just to get up on stage and to know oh these are the stereotypes how people see me oh thank you Absolutely. for sharing this Kristen let's move on to you hello um I I'm having some internet connectivity problems so I'm I'm sorry if I freeze but just raise a hand if you can't hear me anymore um hi I'm Kristen Yancey and I'm based in New York I, I live in Brooklyn um and yeah, I actually also came up as a dancer. I, I've been dancing my whole life. Um, and I moved to New York to pursue a career in concert dance and pretty quickly fell into musical theater because I, <laughs> yes, Brooklyn, um, because I love telling stories and I missed telling stories. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting, Dominic, hearing hearing what you said because I it's been a theme of this last year while for me, while Broadway was dark, one of the only th things that you can do in this time is uh, I've been taking uh, film and TV acting classes. I, I've been challenged over and over again to uh, cast myself alternatively. And it's really been a struggle for me. It's been, um, <sighs> It's been a really eye-opening experience because I, in the past, have tended to look for the one person of color, the one track that was cast with a black actor, and be like, okay, that's what I'm going for. And I never, I never thought to open open that up. And, and you know, like that goes across race and gender. I've never sat down and been like, which role in this show would I really love to play, regardless of you know like let's take it out of time and space for a moment um and i think it's really important because the box that people put us in is teacher tell me at some point this year like you have to tell your agents how to see you you have to tell casting how to cast you you have to do the creative work on your end um and and show them what you want to play you have to bring that into the room which i think is so smart but it's it's difficult to be honest it's difficult there is not there's not a lot out there um i when i was in summer uh, Donna Summer in the middle of her life and that role was a true triple threat role and we talked about a lot how it had never existed before. The triple threat roles on Broadway tend to cater towards a stereotype and it's generally a Latin woman. Um, and, and it just, at some point during the run of that show, I was just like, I, I don't know what it would have felt like to be 10 years old uh, watching this show, watching somebody who looked like me getting to do all of these things on stage, you know, like, getting to have the dance break and sing down and tell the story you know it's just it doesn't it doesn't happen that often and when it does it's usually a, as a statement you know it's it's groundbreaking you know it, it, it's just it's very rare um so it's something i've worked on a lot this year and so it's 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 fresh when it comes to this conversation it's one of the first things i thought of is 
how do we make it easier to see ourselves in places we haven't been before, you know? It's amazing how much we yearn for something that a lot of other folks get to just have. And that is just to see visible role models, just to see sort of this confirmation of, oh, that's possible. And it's a big thing to put on you, the performers, to say, well, you just have to tell your your agent how to see you because your agent is probably saying, ah, no, I know a lot. or And I don't have an agent, obviously. But <laughs> so I can sort of speak to my stereotypes. But they might say, no, no, this is what you should do or I had somebody like you and this these are the roles whereas I love this idea Kristen where you're saying how you all get to envision what you're doing there's this interesting tension that has come up or I should say more friction um, rather than like an actual tension but between traditional repertory roles and then new roles new works that are written and how all of you have already talked about sort of whether it's classical ballet or it's, um, you know, traditional uh, golden age musicals or something or new works that are being written. Do you, um, I don't, this is sort of out of the blue and feel free to talk about what you want, but are there, is there sort of um, a, a freedom or liberation in being able to do a traditional role, but with your body, your face, your being, or is it more enjoyable to do sort of a new role that um, is like Michael Jackson or Donna Summer or something like that? Um, in the yeah in the UK um, there is quite a lot of um, they revive quite a lot of the traditional musical theatre shows um, which for me being a bigger woman as well as being a mixed race woman as well as you know I'm not often seen as being able to dance well enough to be able to do a triple threat role so kind of mirror, mirroring what Kristen said there there isn't always the opportunity to do that triple threat role and for me the only time in place I got to do that was when a newer musical was revived in the UK they brought um, The Life um, which was originally done on Broadway they brought that over to the UK and that was my first ever chance to have um, sung danced and act and I don't know if anybody knows much about The Life the musical it's absolutely iconic and all the girls do an incredible dance break massive dance break in the middle and I actually got the opportunity to do that as well as sing which was so incredible to do because um as Dominic said we trained at Lane and it is we we do a lot in um traditional dance and I can do all those things I can tap I can do this I can't do that but often I never would ever get called in for your 42nd street or your anything that contains anything classical because one, I would definitely say there are only a limited number of roles for anyone of colour in those productions, as well as um, a um, you wouldn't even get called in if you're above a certain size. So it's nice to see that slightly changing a little bit. And the only way that sort of happens at the moment is if something is new. So if it is a new era type of show, so you're um, so something coming over and being revived or something being completely brand new, like um, the Nativity that I did, uh, Nativity the Musical, which is in the UK, it's a film which has been adapted to a musical. And then I also got to play my own role and yeah it's kind of mirroring what everybody else has said um everyone behind the scenes is white everyone who's written the script is white all the entire cast is white the ensembles were everyone um on that production was white and it that's the norm for us here I would say Dominic I don't know if you feel the same it's kind of normal for us here but it's not a good normal it's something that we would love to challenge and it's definitely something we would love to see change as well yeah I, I'm oh so many thoughts especially as the opera scholar I just want to talk to you guys all day Ephraim and um Kristen is that the norm in the US in terms of having, and I think it talking about, uh, what was it, behind the table? Somebody used that uh, term, which I love, backstage, offstage. Is it, are there more voices of people of color? And obviously in this room right now, we're really interested in portrayals of blackness, but also with other people. Is it getting better or how is it in the US? Either of you. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll start. I hope I don't cut you off, Kristen. Um, 
I, I would say it's getting better uh, for sure. I would say we're slowly but surely uh, sort, of, sort of opening up our minds and our mind's eye to say, oh, wait, this is another possibility. And it doesn't have to be based in stereotype for this person of color to fulfill this role or to do this, uh, you know what I mean? So these uh, triple threat kind of things, especially, uh, I was talking about being uh, on the other side of the table in the way that, again, a lot of times in order for us to dream these things, to see them on stage, it goes, it's beyond who's literally on stage playing the part. What we find is, you know, like I, I think very often there's not one black casting agency in all of New York City, right? There's no, although, especially for Broadway, who's, who gives the green light to who's on the stage in the first place uh, are all white casting for the most part. There's not one. So, you know what I mean? We just don't, again, so you're talking about people who a lot of times won't have any kind of malintentions in heart or anything, but like literally that's not the perspective. That's not their reality. Uh, so they don't think and they don't see in these ways because they didn't have to. Um, but now slowly but surely because of and I would say a lot more of the uh, newer things being made, uh, which is, I think, always my go-to as a creative. Like, I, you know, I've always respect to what's come before, but my mind has always been much more interested in what can we create. I love that uh, Kristen said, uh, let's think outside of time and space uh, and, and start to envision ourselves a new way. So uh, all, of, all that to say, the new, new creations, I think, have started to open up the doors for um, us to re-envision what what is uh, what we want to see on stage, and it has been happening. Like I said, slowly but surely, but still, oftentimes based in whatever stereotype. Still, oftentimes uh, it's a white man that has written uh, <laughs> whatever show or whatever musical. Like I, I was just asked about uh, the Hairspray uh, musical that I got to play the part of CBJ Stubbs, which is a very um, Hairspray is a tricky musical right now, right? Right. The 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 creators of Hairspray just called me not too long ago saying, "Hey, we want to talk to you about how you're feeling." Uh, because we we realize that we live in a time now where you know we have to think about what we said as white men back in the early '90s, probably when they made it. But back then, they didn't have they didn't have to care. Right now, all of these things are hitting ahead because it's a pandemic and everybody's sitting at home and doesn't have anything else better to do. You know what I mean? And and the things that we've been going through, especially as people of color, are all on the surface now, and we're having to deal with them. And especially our white counterparts and even our allies are having to see and recognize things for the first time. All that to say. They were like, yeah, so was that problematic for you to play? And it was weird because my response wasn't that it was uh, problematic so much as, because again, I think us as human beings and I hope the purpose of theater is uh, how to gain uh, other perspectives, empathy, uh, intention, right? Uh, so I knew for them, uh, even the, it being two white men that were writing this part, talking about, oh, the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. For, for them, that entire show was almost satire, right? That, that entire show was literally putting stereotypes so blatant and in your face that we're saying that this is how big it is, how loud it is, and why we're trying to cross these boundaries. The purpose of the show was to highlight them with the purpose of crossing the boundaries, literally saying these things. So although, yes, it was a white man that wrote it, I didn't think it was coming from a true, as much of a place of uh, ignorance or our, our lack of sort of, um, I don't know, uh, a lack of sort of graciousness behind, like maybe I shouldn't be saying these things. It was like, no, I, I thought I was writing this so I could say, hey guys, we should stop judging the black man that walks down the Broadway street because you, you know what I mean? Like off, off of just sheer appearance. Like I always give this anecdote. It's not even, it's not an anecdote, it's a real story. Like I remember I was leaving uh, uh, the show after Ain't Too Proud one night. And you know, I live, leave a show where I just got my first Tony nomination and people are like applauding and all these things. I finished signing autographs at the stage door and I walk a block down and my dresser literally sees me standing on the block for about 10 minutes because I still can't catch a cab yet. The yeah. same people, you know what I mean? Like yeah, they, when I, I walk I up my block. When and I these walk stories my block are and, so yeah. important to say. You have said so much and I want to give other folks um, an opportunity to jump in. So, I, I, but thank you, we'll still keep it going. I'm speaking quickly because I'm trying to get it so much. So Dominic, did you want to say anything about Hairspray? Because I know you've also played um, Seaweed, that character. And then Kristen, I want you thinking about um, things in the US as compared to um, the UK. And Delisa, you just have so many great things to say, just jump in. <laughs> There is there is so much to, so much to say about everything that's been said. I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, but in, in terms of you and say, how did you feel about playing this role? <laughs> I did. I didn't get that. <laughs> but um, in terms going back a bit to in terms of um, agent submissions for stuff, I have I've really been blessed with my agent in the sense that he is 
he's been fantastic from beginning to end. He's just been so sort of like, are you going for this? I'm like, really? So yeah, why would you not? I was like, okay, cool. And he's been amazing. I couldn't fault him for that at all. Um, I, there, are, there have been some submissions um, my friends have experienced that they'll ask me some stuff like uh, one, of, one, of my, one of my closest friends, um, a guy called Akeem, he is incredibly talented, a, a, a wonderful guy. And he was submitted for, I think it was, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, and it was Dirty Dancing. And it was talking about ensemble um, or some, some other role in the show, but he wasn't talking about the character Johnny, who I don't know how, if many of you know the show, but he's, he's a strong dancer, strong singer. He's a handsome guy, tall guy, well built. And he, he's sort of the, lo- the love interest. And I was like, that's, that's, your, that's your cast type. You're just not, that, you're just not white. But, but why, why is that? Why is that a reason that he shouldn't be submitted for that role? You are perfect for it. Right, right. And um, was it he didn't see himself as it? I think we've conditioned ourselves to not, as we said before, we've conditioned ourselves to not see that. He's perfect for the role. But it was, it was something that we've had to, uh, we conditioned ourselves to, to, to believe that, okay, well, that's not us, we have to find this other part. Um, and actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote him, actually, um, based on what Jaleesa said as well, about not seeing ourselves in these roles, um, not, well, not, not being seen, but not being um, submitted for these castings or casting people not seeing us as those um, particular characters. Um, but he uh, actually he posted a video on Instagram about it, which I will share on the group afterwards, about the types of characters that there are within shows. Um, there are so many, and I think he, I, I'm probably misquoting him, but he said there are, there's there's a smart one, the funny one, the tall one, the short one, the the joker, the prankster. The there's all these different things, and then there's the black one, or there's yeah. the, the wow. <laughs> right. there's just that that role there's, it, there's no dimensions within that sort of this quintessential other yeah <laughs> there's just oh. the funny one or the, or the black one not the there's there's not there's not that there's not the the handsome one or the handsome black one that the, the funny black one there's just the black one yeah. um which i was like wow that's <laughs> i think i and i hadn't even thought about it. like that's incredible that i'm just like uh, christian said as well that we're just looking for that one part like, which which one can i play there's me okay that one I mean, we're not going to see the show. We just see that one character. Um, and in terms of in terms of hairspray, I'm sorry, I'm trying to catch up on all my thoughts. I've been no, writing things okay. down furiously and as I've been going. I want to get Kristen um, in, in, as soon as we can. But yes, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. In, ter- in terms of hairspray, um, show. I I found the show was it was it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Um, that there, there is this sort of a. Uh, thought that I have about a lot of shows that were written um, at this sort of time was like how, how much how much of it was uh, to to show the injustice and how much of it was to 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 be a part of it to 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 get that sort of market in to get to, rather than it being to support but being to um, as I'm sure a lot of us have seen over lockdown like invites to to be a part of how much this company supports the BLM movement and it's like do you <laughs> do you yeah. actually support that or are you trying to sort of to to use to use this wave to further your own needs and ends it's, it's a sort of a your, your morality is marketing <laughs> rather than true morality and um, it's so complicated and particularly with yeah past you know this year with both the lockdown the black lives matter movement is so strong here in the u.s and i know it's resonated outside i so uh, and i think for a panel so quick it's so rich to have all these different types of comments kristen you're back this is wonderful and i want to give you a chance to jump in on any of these things (laughs) i'm so sorry i can't believe how bad my internet is um but I am still catching, <laughs> I'm still catching most of, I can hear you even if I'm frozen. Um, and, and yeah, I, I agree. I've had similar experience, experiences. Um, something that I'm thinking about when we're talking about people behind the table or the people making, um, making the work, bringing me into the room is I, one of the most special productions I've ever been a part of was a production of West Side Story at the Guthrie in the Thrust, but the they brought in a dramaturg who really pushed 
the casting of that particular show. So the Jets were incredibly diverse, but very purposefully cast to reflect an actual New York neighborhood at that time. So our Jets were black and white and Asian, and the influx was the, this Puerto Rican community that were, they were the newest to settle in that area. And it just felt very current while also being historically accurate. Um, and I, it, it made me interested because I've done that show a few times. I've done Evita and, you know, we're having this conversation about revivals. I was very inspired by the production of Oklahoma that was most recently on Broadway and at St. Anne's Warehouse. I, I think we're not going to stop reviving shows, you know, like there will always be revivals on Broadway. And so I, I am very interested in a, an approach that updates the show, that looks at it critically as a text, as a historical text, but now in 2021. And I, I do think, you know, we're creative people. That's why we do what we do. So I, I'm interested in how we can keep pushing in that direction and, and, and it's not colorblind casting. We're not ready for colorblind casting. What we need is intentional casting. You know, what we need is the intentional crafting of these shows. Um, and it's just something, because I got to be a part of that particular project, um, it's something that I think about a lot now, even when I'm making my own work. How do we, how do we cast diversely, not just for the sake of casting diversely, like let's legitimize these stories. You know, it's not enough to have an ensemble of people playing maids and servants and taxi cab drivers that are, you know, beautiful to look at, but we haven't given them agency on stage. So I don't know. That's oh. well. <laughs> absolutely right. I'm wondering, since a big theme that has come up is the types of roles that are there and having people behind the table to make these decisions. Jalisa, have you ever thought of sort of, and I'm not trying to get you off the stage because you need to be on the stage dancing and singing and doing all that triple threat stuff. But is there a way that you've thought maybe one day at some point you'd want to go behind the table, so to speak? Definitely, I would love to reverse roles. We are all obviously um, will become quite old in time. So <laughs> dancing and singing, I probably won't be able to do forever, unfortunately. Um, but how I've started that currently is I've just started my own children's agency. So from there, then I'm sort of like being able to input how the children these days are being seen rather than rather than going straight in at the top kind of thing and also I run my own dance and theatre school which there I find is so important again to be what a reflection of what I never saw so I was always taught by um, a white teacher I'd never ever cross paths with um, a black or mixed race teacher until I actually got to Lane and I was taught um, contemporary by an ex Alvin Ailey um, dance company member at the time, which was incredible and it was so inspiring. So for me, um, that's the way I'm approaching it currently to hopefully one day build up to be on the other side of the table. So yeah, um, going in um, through the children currently. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. What a great idea to sort of to help that pipeline with all the because we know the talent is there. It's just who feels who gets supported, who sees that as a possibility. I think we're down to our last two minutes. And is there anything else anybody else wants to jump in and say, I so appreciate you guys. I would say that, uh, again, speaking to us getting behind the table. And uh, I think that's a huge part of, I think, Broadway going forward in terms of theater and all, and also behind the table when it comes to producing and investing. I think that's huge for us because we also want to change who's out in the audience. Most of the times we look in, a, we can have an all black show and an all white audience. Uh, so we're trying to change the entire culture of theater. And I think uh, right now it's high time for people like myself, all of us panelists, hopefully, uh, that have dreamt of working, uh, not telling other people's stories, but telling our own to go ahead and just put the pen to the paper. And that's definitely what's happening. I know between myself and a lot of other people in the community saying, hey, now is the time that not just to do it, but like they're actually asking for us because they know they can't do it anymore. Please, what ideas do you have? We'll fund you, we'll, like the support is there, sadly because of all the, the black death that we're experiencing and the conversation surrounding it. But now definitely is the time to just actualize it in any way we can. 
I think it's so powerful to have coalitions. So when they come to you, you can say, wait a minute, I know this, you know, British gal, this Welsh woman, Delisa, and we need to get her involved and Dominic and oh, my best friend, Kristen, you know, just so we can have this, this community. Other comments? I know we've got like just 30 seconds. Dominic, you. I mean, there's, there's so much, there's so much to say. I think, um, as I said, we are, we are moving in the right direction. In, in the UK as well, we're going the right way with everything. Um, but it, it doesn't mean we can take our foot off, off American foot off the gas. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can't stop now. Yeah, Everything either. has to keep moving forward. <laughs> that wasn't American accent. Just then, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, got off it. The gas. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of work to do and I'm, I'm just glad we're having these conversations. It just, it makes a difference. It really does make a huge difference. I'm just, I'm yeah, so grateful to be part of this. In the UK, we are a little bit behind you guys in regards to moving forward, but only last week there was an incredible new um, cast uh, released for Beauty and the Beast, and both oh, The yeah. Beast and Beauty are both um, people of colour, and there's also an incredibly mixed cast of on the ensemble. All the children are black in the show, um, so that's going to be incredible, and that's actually the first ever show that's been sort of flipped on his head. Um, so we are moving forward, but hopefully we move even more forward. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Kristen, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but feel free to have Oh, thank our you so much. It's, it's just, it's nice to, it's nice to hear you know, <clears throat> it's nice to hear from other people in the community. And I, yeah, I, it's, um, it's always surprising how similar stories feel, you know, like how often you relate regardless of where you are or how you come into the industry. I, I just think we have so much in common. The experience is so common and it's global. Um, so it's just been really nice to, to hear what you all have to say. And I hope, yeah, I hope we meet again and I hope, um, we start, we create together. I, you know, I, I agree with Ephraim. I think the next phase of this is, is getting more, more work out there and more, more black writers and more black stories by black people and more, you know, Pacific Islander stories by Pacific, you know, like I just, I think it's time, it's time to get the work out there from inception coming from the people who, who live it. Yeah. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Jalisa, Kristen, Ephraim, Dominic, thank you um, for sharing your time today, your insights. I hope you can see some of the comments. Uh, people are really reacting and, and I think this conversation could just continue all afternoon. Um, it's so powerful. Um, I really thank you for participating. Uh, Naomi, thank you for facilitating the, the conversation. It was really wonderful. Um, and again, very powerful. And, and thanks to you all uh, for participating in the Stage Struck Conference. And, and we appreciate it very much.